So what I want to do is go over a, a, very quickly a process of how you can think about making decisions. And I think everything I'm going to present to you in the next 15 minutes, if you, if you think about all these things when you're making a decision, you pretty much got it covered when you're making a decision about drug therapy. So, you have a patient in front of you. I'm sure you are familiar with this person. There are doctors, and they have goodies. And I refer to those as therapeutics. They make lifestyle recommendations, and this could be any health professional, it just happens to be a doctor. It could be a pharmacist, it could be a nurse, it, doesn't, it could be a nurse practitioner, it could be a naturopathic, it doesn't matter. They have stuff to recommend, lifestyle. Medications, surgery, psychotherapy, that's about it. I guess I can't think of anything else that we could recommend, but those are the main things that we could recommend. And the concept is, we're going to give that or recommend it to our patients. So what are the, what's the thought process that, that has to go through this? Because most of the time, it is confusing to people. And they get anxious about things. And they're, or they're anxious about the medical condition they have right at that time. And so you've got to think about a lot of things when we're doing uh, this for patients. So. Making drug therapy decisions requires you to think about a number of things. Symptomatic versus preventative. Those are two different things. If they're symptomatic versus preventative. And you need to consider whether they're clinical benefits, surrogate benefit, or, uh, or looking, looking at symptomatic outcomes. What's the outcome you're trying to change? Clinical trial evidence. Do you lose clinical trial evidence or experience? What happens if you do nothing? And what happens if you give treatment? I showed you a little bit of example about relative and absolute benefits. You gotta look at, so whenever you're making a therapeutic decision, you gotta think of the benefits, the harms, the costs, and the inconvenience. Because those are all things that come into play when people are making a decision. You gotta make sure the patient understands what's going on, and I, in my opinion, there's no other way. They need to be aware, and that's one of our primary roles, I think, as healthcare professionals. And who makes the decision? Is it the clinician? Now, if I'm in an intensive care unit, I just got hit by a truck, eh, probably the clinician. Unless it's life-threatening, I want to participate in it. But not everybody wants to participate in the decision, but we'll talk about that. And then you need to know, are they very sick or not so sick? Because that'll help you figure out what dose you need. And then you always reevaluate. So now I'm going to go through and just talk a, a little bit more detail about that. So if you have a symptomatic condition, there. They're symptomatic. They're not feeling good. If I can give a drug that helps that person, that's good. Because they had a symptom to begin with. If it's preventative, most of the time, if, for things like cholesterol, blood pressure, uh, uh, elevated glucose, they're feeling good. And then you tell them, oh, you got diabetes, you got high blood pressure, you got cholesterol. And we then tell them, we think we can hopefully stop that. The problem is we can't stop all of them and you'll eventually probably have it anyway. So we take, it, we take that person from here, and we make him feel sick. Because it is impossible to make an asymptomatic patient feel better. So we have an asymptomatic patient. Now, I'm not saying we don't do all of this stuff. I'm just saying you need to think about it. So when we're thinking about it, so we had uh, symptomatic and preventative stuff, we also have to think about what's the end point. Clinical versus surrogate versus symptomatic outcomes. We've got to think the difference. If it's death, that's an important outcome for most people. Heart attacks, probably an important outcome. Yeah, you know, if you could prevent something like that, that would be a good thing. Broken legs, if you could prevent that or you could reduce the chance of fractures or whatever, those are all really important endpoints to patients. This is an important one, if we could prevent those sorts of things. That, I don't think we have drugs that do that, and probably drugs cause that, if I, uh, <laughs> illegal drugs. But what we do is we spend a lot of time looking at testing things that may not have nearly as much importance. So we look at things like blood pressure and LDL and HDL. And there are drugs that lower LDL that do nothing to cardiovascular events and that raise HDL, which is your healthy LDL, and do nothing to heart attacks. And bone density. So we do a lot of tests. These are the important outcomes. These are much less important. They're the surrogate markers that most patients, they, 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 that you don't know. They, they, it's not something you feel. We also have levels of evidence, so you need to think about what level of evidence are we using when we're making a decision. If you're looking at clinical trial evidence, now you don't need clinical trial evidence, you don't need a randomized controlled trial for parachutes. It's pretty obvious. 
everybody jumps out of a plane without dead. Put them on a parachute, most people live. Need a randomized control trial for that. It's fairly intuitive. But we do want, we want to look at clinical trials. We want useful pieces of information. But much of what we do is on the basis of clinical experience. Now, clinical experience is okay. It's kind of fun, and most of the time you do okay with it. But I would suggest to you that we really need to think about the type of evidence when we're making a decision. Because certain uh, knowledge can only be obtained from well-designed randomized controlled trials. We need to consider that relative benefit. So here's a whole bunch of people. If we were to say they all had some sort of a risk factor, the way we'd figure out if, if there was a benefit is we'd split them in two, not physically, but you know. And we give one group a drug and one group a placebo, and we'd see how many of them ended up having a heart attack or a stroke. In the placebo group, it would be about 6%, as an example, if we were talking about statins. And in the drug group, it would be 4%. So that, you would hear that that is a 33% reduction. But what's the actual benefit? What's the absolute benefit? Yeah, it's a 2% benefit. That's the number that you need to be familiar with. The problem is, is you don't know who that's going to be. I do. There's one of them. That person out of that big mass of people did not have a heart attack. And that guy. They can be good and bad. There is no way to predict who that person is. <laughs> but it's two out of that mass of people who would have benefited. The rest of them would have had nothing done to them but harm, at least over that five-year period. So. That's when it comes to preventative therapy. When we're talking about symptomatic things, if you can take this guy, give him a drug, and get to this, that's pretty good, because you can see that change. Now, it may not be due to the drug, but at least you can see that change, because it's a symptomatic thing. That's a, in, 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 with a question, not a question mark, almost should be quotation marks, that's an absolute benefit, because you can see it. All of these decisions that you make about drug therapy there are benefits and harms. There's good and there's bad. One of the things we recommend quite often is things like uh, lifestyle changes. And so we, before you make any decisions about drug therapy, you hope that people have done some lifestyle changes, especially for some of the conditions that we didn't talk about. We want people to be more active and maybe make different decisions on food. Maybe that would help. But I'm not saying don't eat donuts. I heard apparently a donut is the Canadian, is uh, the food that identifies us most in the world, a donut. <laughs> well done, Canada. <laughs> How many here, who doesn't like donuts? Good, don't eat them. I like donuts. I'm going to eat the occasional donut. I'm going to eat eggs too, because I like them. If I was morbidly obese, I might do something different. Now, no comments. So we, we got, there's a whole bunch of things we need to do that are non-drug before we even consider stuff to do with medications. So when it comes to medications and other therapies, how do we think about those? Well, there are some unforeseen side effects that you've always got to remember. You can get bitten by these if you don't think about them, and you need to let the patients know about them. So that's one of the harms that we've got to think about. And then there's the cost of everything. A cost is just a side effect. If you're Bill Gates, no side effect. If you're any of you guys, I guess, because you're all, in theory, poor, <laughs> although I know not all of you are, money is, is a side effect. And how inconvenient is it? How much do you have to do to make sure you take the exact right drug on the right day? It is not a fun thing to do. Some people don't mind doing it. But there's always an inconvenience to something. So you've got to think about those key things when you're deciding between different drug therapies or whether or not you're going to do it. It's that benefit, harms, cost, and sort of the inconvenience or the, the process that you have to undergo to do that. One of the most important things is the patient has to understand those benefits and harms. And that sometimes takes a while to think about because you, in general, have a person who's very nervous about things. And so what do we do with that? Well, as healthcare professionals, we're able to help. Our job is to help that person become smarter about their medical condition. Or they should be doing a lot of that themselves, going to a computer and looking up some of that information. Google is a great service. Not every piece of information there is great, but a lot of it is just outstanding. Because what you want to do is, 
if you have a patient who has a medical condition, you want to make them smarter. That's your job, to make them aware of the medical condition and go from that perspective. So decisions, when we're making decisions, if you have a smarter patient, it is difficult, there's buttons and stuff, and what do I do, and I really don't know what to do. And even if you're looking at a map, which way do I go? How do I make a decision? What you want to do is have that person be involved in that decision-making process. You want them to have to think about whether or not they wish to take therapy, and it's okay to do that. This person can help, guide it, or is it that person who should make the decision? I would suggest to you that the vast majority of time, it should be this person making the decision, not this person making the decision. Now, sometimes, it's a joint decision. <laughs> That's okay. You're both making a decision about that. It's the healthcare provider and the patient and the family and all that. That is totally cool, too. But I would suggest that it's much of the things that we do should be centered around the patient, which is why it's called shared informed decision making. So that's a really important thing to think about. Now we need to think about how sick they are. This is a huge issue when it comes to making a decision about doses and, and how aggressive one would be. If you're really sick or if the outcome will very rapidly be bad, you're going to do lots of potential things, even without the greatest of evidence. That's when you give a really big dose. And you give it fast and immediately, as much as you can, within reason. So if they're a really sick person, that's when you start thinking about giving sort of bigger doses. Because what you do not want to have happen is at the end go, ah, maybe I should have used something, or maybe I could have used a bit more, because you don't want that to be the end result. So when they're really sick, you give big doses, and you're more aggressive. But that doesn't happen very often. Most people that you will see in a regular day-to-day -day practice are not very sick. They're going to be requiring very small doses. And I talked about this in one of the last lectures, is just giving a little bit. Because we take relatively normal people, and we want them to just take a little bit. See, you have a little bit of beer in there. Just a little dose to see what happens. And she's just going to have a sip of wine. Because we don't know what's going to happen. If we give too much, we might end up with that. <laughs> well, that, I don't know. But maybe bad things can happen if you use too big a dose. And most of the time, there's no hurry. And then the key feature is no matter what you do, you reevaluate on a regular basis. That might be every hour. It might be every day. It might be every month. They may no longer have that condition. So you're always reevaluating whether they have high blood pressure, whether they've become more active and, and maybe uh, they have a, a more healthy diet and maybe their, some of their lab values have changed. And you need to always reevaluate. Okay, I have two minutes. And what I want you guys to do, I wanted you, I wanted you guys to follow those pictures. Now, I'm going to take the words away and you're going to tell me, I'm going to mix it all up, and you're going to tell me what these pictures make you think of. Because that is your goal, is a happy patient. So let's recap. I need you to use your brain. Now, I know there's not much room in there because there's beer, and then there's sex, and then there's sex and beer, but that's OK. <laughs> so what does this make you think of? What do you got to think about? Evidence. Evidence, clinical trials. Good, impressive, eh? I don't even have the words up there. And you're going, I'm looking at a picture of Lisa Simpson, and I'm going, clinical trials, well done. <laughs> I'm trying to get that into your brain. What do you have to, what's this? If they're... Very impressive. What about here? Yeah, absolute risk reduction, relative risk reduction. Not everyone benefits all that, good. Boy, oh, you guys are smart now. That's impressive. Reevaluate. So, regular reevaluation. Yeah, because they're not sick. There's no hurry for most of these things. So, you're going to use a, a low dose? Good. What about this? Yeah, so it's an absolute improvement. You've got a person who's got some symptoms, 
if you give them something and they get better, that's a really positive thing that you can at least hang your hat on. What about this? So what are the things you're supposed to think about? Side effects? Cost? Inconvenience? Very impressive. So lifestyle changes? Yeah? So think about those. So what do you think? So symptomatic treatment, yeah, versus uh, prevention and so on. What about this? What are you supposed to think about there? Yeah, so you're supposed to think a little bit about surrogates, but also the really, clinical, really important clinical outcomes, like death and electrocution and things like that. Those are the things that really matter to patients. What about this? Yeah, make the patients, sm patients smarter. That's your job to guide them through that process or show them how to get smarter. What about this? Yeah, joint decision making. Yeah, I'm sure you're like that just going, hello, yeah, I know that. So it's all about involving that patient in the decision making process. So you guys did a really good job. So what I wanted to do there was show you that I just showed you a bunch of pictures of the Simpsons. And it made you think about all of the issues that you need to be aware of with therapeutics. And if you look at this, this is a picture of the world made out of drugs. One of our grad students here has a, is really a good artist, and he made a picture of the world. These are all pills. You can't quite see it. But these are all of the things you need to think about. Numbers needed to treat, education, shared informed decision making, preferences. Uh, what else is up there? Risks, evidence, all those things when you're making a decision. So for the rest of the therapeutics courses, I want, to th I want you to think of your patient as either Homer or Marge or one of those guys and think about all the really important things to think about. So thanks for listening.